Good. Let's uh, give a give them a minute for the latecomers. You know, people rushing home from work. You know, oh no, nobody's doing that anymore. Nobody's doing that these days. Yeah. Right. Okay. When if people arrive, uh, David will let them in. So I'm gonna. I think we should start. Really. Okay. So welcome to Grow at Home Artist Talks, a series where we hear from artists and authors about their work and practice. And Grow at Home was made possible by the Arts Council England Cultural Recovery Fund, which we're very very grateful for. We'll be live streaming tonight and recording, so it will be archived on our website. And we also sometimes use screen grabs for publicity purposes. So please be aware that if you are not comfortable with being recorded, you need to switch off your webcam. There'll be a Q&A at the end of the talk. Um, please uh, put any questions during the talk and comments. Uh, feel free to do that during the chat. And I'll be taking notes of them and um, I'll, I'll field them at the, uh, at the end of the talk. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Hannah Jane Smith, um, an artist who specialises in line oil print and uh, natural dyes. Her work explores nature through the lens of folklore and rural occultism, using the reoccurring motifs of hands and eyes alongside totemic images of animals and plants to examine the role of humans as interpreters and observers of the natural world. Hannah gathers plants from local woodlands to create natural dyes and inks. The process of collecting, extracting and dyeing is steeped in tradition. Making natural dyes from foraged plants continues her exploration of our relationship with plants and the cycles of nature. Ladies and gentlemen, Hannah Jane Smith. Hi, hello, uh, thanks Pete. Thank you very much. Thanks, Grove, for having me as well. It's a pleasure and it's been like very exciting. I've been watching everyone. I've been really enjoying everything I've watched so far. It's been fantastic. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. I'm gonna bring up my thing if I can. Can everyone see that? It should be up now. Um, so yeah, I'm a printmaker. I'm from Australia originally. Um, and I did uh, my studies there and then I came over um, in 2013. Um, I originally studied archeology span uh, and then I did a fine art degree after that. Um, and I sort of, I think the connection between those is history and this idea of like, um, you know, going back and sort of exploring history and the processes that sort of are used in these two things that I do. So lino cut, uh, well, actually I didn't do lino cut first, I did etching. And um, etching is sort of this old process that hasn't really changed very much. It's sort of, you use acid bars and you use steel and bitumen and it's sort of is this process that's sort of always been the same. And at the same time as studying that, I was studying natural dyes and that sort of hasn't changed in hundreds of years and thousands of years you know you need a mordant and you need salt and there's all these sort of slow slow processes that are going on so that was something that I was really fascinated by this sort of way of making art that the, through the process of it connects back to history um, and all sort of things um, but then in 2013 I moved to the UK I moved to London and um, Hackney Wick and I uh, didn't have a studio and I was sort of, wasn't really sure how to set one up either. And I especially couldn't set one up to do um, etching and the things I wanted to do. Um, I'm trying to change the screen. How do I, there we go. Um, so, oh yeah, I wanted to do like etching, but I didn't have a way of sort of making that at home. It's for, you know, there's lots of chemicals and things involved. Um, so I turned to lino cut instead, um, and you can do lino cut anywhere. Um, so I did. So I sort of, I was working in sour space in the cafe there and I'd go there and I'd set up a little temporary studio and I'd make their coffee bags and 
it was very hands-on and it was sort of, I really loved the fact that people responded to it straight away and they sort of asked me to be involved in things and to, to the collaborative nature of Hackney Week was like, what are you doing? Let's kind of, let's get together and let's work on something together. Um, so I did that for a couple of years and was involved in the exhibitions around the place. So there's this one, um, which was in the White Building, I think, um, when I was first in London. And that was to do with like, robots and humans interaction with robots. So this is the first time I'd done a production print um, and I didn't do a very good job of it, <laughs> but it was fun anyway to sort of try the medium out and sort of play around with it. Um, and then this is when I sort of started to get into the kind of images that I would use and the sort of style that I would continue to use throughout my work and still sort of do. And one of those is skulls. Um, I love a skull, um, you know, use them as much as possible. And I think that's something to do with cycles of nature again and sort of this memento mori idea, this sort of the fact that it's always beneath the surface or around the corner and it doesn't stop you from living your life. In fact, thinking about death and knowing that death is there should enrich your life and should sort of make you kind of want to do things more and want to fulfil things more and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and it's inevitable, you know, it's always going to be there. Um, so this is from Style Space Exhibition from 2014, 2015. Uh, I did this and I did a few smaller pieces. <laughs> this one as well. Um, I think it's something that like I would have done in high school, <laughs> but I didn't. Um, so that one wasn't, yeah, the skull one was, and then this one was in there too. Um, and this is when I started to sort of, get into the imagery and the style that I keep on using. And I think it really connects back to tattoo culture as well. And this sort of use of very bold images that like aren't necessarily contained in a narrative. Um, they're more symbolic and they definitely sort of speak to something um, that's more inherent in your, your understanding of visual language. Um, so like when I first started getting tattoos, um, people would come up and they'd be like, oh, what's, you know, what's your tattoo mean? And they really wanted you to have a, they want me to have a reason for them that's like really core, like really fundamental. Like it's about my father. It's about, you know, there's a story behind it. It's, oh, we got drunk and my friends. But a lot of the time they're not about that. They're, they're, I want to have them in my body because they remind me of something. They remind me of something else. And it's part of a bigger story. And I think that's sort of what I want my work to be like a bit as a printmaker as well. I don't want to sort of, give you the whole story. I sort of like the idea of someone being able to find something that fits with them, but I know what I'm, to, you know, it has a story for me. And if it has a similar story to you, then that's pretty good, <laughs> but it doesn't have to. Um, so yeah, there's this one. And hands is something that I start to use quite a lot. I like this and then nature as well. And this idea of sort of, I mean, I was, I think early on in printmaking with, with liner cut, I sort of fell in love with the idea of how it was a, a craft. Um, you know, it's sort of, it's something that, it's not an old skill, I mean, wood, cut, wood cutting is, but lino cut is something that people, they were getting tiles, like lino tiles, and they were carving them and they were printing on them and they are using it to, to go out and protest something or to go and make a statement about something. And it's very much like DIY and ready-made and sort of, you know, and, I like that. I like that it's sort of, it's, a, you know, it's something you can sort of um, just do without having to have a big sort of um, history behind it or something it's kind of thing like that. Like it's something that you can sort of give to other people and like it's multiplied, you know, we make, we doable. Um, so yeah, and you make it with your hands and it's something that, you know, you give to people sort of craft in a way. Um, so yeah, start using hands a bit, um, and sort of coming back to the idea of multiples and things and something things that you do. This one is one that um, is really popular. So when I started to sell works, um, I made this one, and I started doing it on did it on t-shirts as well, and I've done it. Um, I've done an edition of it that's quite a big edition. Um, and so one of the interesting things with printmaking is that you can have this, you create multiples, you know, and have a big collection of the, the same image. And so it sort of does it 
devalue it and at what point do you stop doing that so like I think kind of similar to the idea of painting something you don't want to you know you reach a point in painting something that you know you don't want to keep painting it anymore it's sort of reached reach the perfect spot and I think sort of for me doing an addition is like that it's like I've done an addition and that's all they want to do now I don't want to keep making that addition um this is enough of that <laughs> and so this one is one of those um I've gotten it, even though it's really popular and it's so tempting to sort of keep on making it forever. Uh, you know, you gotta know when to you gotta know when to stop, basically. So this one, solstice. Uh, and that's the block. That's uh, so you can see all the colours and all the layers of um, how many times I've made it different different shades and on different things. Um, yeah, and I think that's something it's kind of a beautiful thing in its own in a way. And uh, I'm definitely gonna keep it. Um, and that's sort of, yeah, the idea of like a palimpsest and like layers of history and something that's something that I really like as well. Um, these little houses, then this is a monoprint, which is really fun to do. And houses again, um, this is something that you did actually uh, for a textiles project. Um, this uh, in a collaboration with some other people. Um, we made um, made this image on bags and um, cushion covers and things like that. So that one have. Yeah, and this is when I start to sort of get more into the memento mori again. So um, there's only one of this, and I sold it a while ago. Um, in the reeds, and another one. This one is called Sarah's, and it's in some grass and some wheat. And so Sarah's is like the goddess of um uh, the, the wheat field and farming and things like that and so there's a cat skull and wheat field it's like a little sacrifice which is the sort of the narrative of that one the bigger story of that one i guess um yeah and this is sort of skulls again i mean they've come up a lot for me <laughs> as you can see and i think it is just that idea of, of connecting to something um, and the tattoo culture as well, obviously, it's sort of the same sort of thing. But this idea of not being not being scared of death and that it's sort of death pretty much kind of something. So Hand of Glory, this one. Um, I really like the story behind this one. So this is like a part of um, occultism that was been around since like the 15th century. And it's this idea of getting a hand from a um, a criminal's corpse. So it had to be a hanged man or something and you cut their hand off um, and you dip it in, in wax or in fat, like it's supposed to be human fat as well, which is pretty gross. But you dip the fingers in human fat and you light them like candles, as you can see. And then you burgle someone and you, or you can break into someone's house, or you can steal their livestock and, and they're not going to wake up. They're sort of in a, in a comatose sort of state. Um, I just think it's really interesting that that's something, and it's become to be bigger than that. It's come to be a symbol for, for occultism and sort of like, I mean, you can, there's this idea that it's a good luck charm now as well. And there's all these sorts of other kind of stories behind it. The narratives kind of spread over time, but that's basically what it's for. It was stealing sheep, which is such a romantic kind of image and a name for something that was actually ends up being uh, quite prosaic in a way, like, you know, it's about livestock. And um, the snake one, the adder. Yeah. Um, start to use like, yeah, this one, it's called Growth and Abundance, which I think is a silly name. It's, it's rabbit funeral, really. Um, this is from a photograph I found of uh, someone who buried a rabbit in amongst these sort of big bunch of wildflowers. I thought that was sort of something that just was such a perfect image to sum up spring and to sum up this idea of reincarnation and rejuvenation and how when we it's okay the constellation of death can just be becoming part of something again it doesn't have to be um you know an afterlife or a, a big thing it could just be becoming big being taken back into nature sort of you know that sort of that sort of cycle of things and actually i have now looking at my work i have done as many eyes as i thought i was going to in these ones um, this one uh, is called Hunter's Moon, and it's about sort of um, coming across a, a deer that sort of that you can't kill in the field. It's sort of something that sort of makes you stop in your tracks and sort of hold your hold your fire, 
basically be in awe of nature rather than want to sort of or, or with nature rather than sort of want to over, overpower it in that sort of way um, and there's something that I really try to come back to also is alchemical symbols and this idea of like um, how people want to sort of make sense of the world so you know they you're trying to sort of find these paths into your own understanding of things, whether that is folklore or science. Um, I mean, that's sort of what I was trying to do with archaeology, I think, and with my early sort of sort of things I was trying to study. So, you know, science is fascinating, and I think there's this great connection between being an art artist and being a scientist, if it's not too pretentious sort of thing to say. It's this idea of sort of wanting to wanting to find out things, wanting to sort of find ways to explore things and discover discover things. And that's like this connection that humans have to want to do that all the time with everything. You, know, you want to find out what's in space, you want to find out how plants work. And, you know, and for a long time, there was no separation between magic and science. And I think that's such a fascinating, I mean, such a fascinating time, you know, in a way, this idea that like they're all connected and the stories that you tell that you pass down, they, you know, they're, they're explaining everything in this way that's really fundamental. They're explaining how seasons work and how your body works and, you know, what animals to have, what animals to grow and how, you know, things like that, things that sort of how people work. And um, then you get to sort of pseudosciences, you get to alchemy, you get to sort of touching around the edges of, of understanding things in this way that's like still based in something kind of magical and um I've always loved the idea of that becoming a thing and that maintain you know that's still being how we live so like you know with this sort of sense of awe about things even if we understand them which I think is you know we do have to a certain extent um yeah so this is, gives you a bit of an indication of how I print um I don't have a press so once I carve the block, which is what you saw before, I um I have to use a spoon. So like so you know rub it on the back with the spoon. So a wooden spoon like this or a metal spoon, um, which is really time consuming and um and it doesn't always work perfectly. So I think I've had to change my expectations a little bit in terms of what the image is going to come out like. So you can see on this one that there's like bits um, that aren't as black as other bits, and that's sort of because I can't press that hard or I can't get them out properly and it's become part of the work. And I think it's something that I really like about it now is this, like, there's a real human sense of it, you know, it's been made by a person and you can really tell that. And I think that even though it's sort of not perfect and printmakers are known for their perfectionism, you know, um, it's okay. Like that's, that's sort of part of how it's going to be and it gives it a sort of bit more tangible thing that I think is kind of, aesthetic that I kind of like now um, even though I try really hard for that not to be how it comes out that's just how it's going to come out um, there's no huge story behind this I just did it because I love octopuses um, I think they're fantastic I think they're fascinating uh, and that's another sort of thing these animal images often that I use I just use because they do have that kind of like totemic connection they have you know there's something very defining about a snake, you know, that you can look at it and you can sort of go, oh, my God, this, I have an association like this with a snake or I have an association like this with a rabbit, you know, and they do have these sort of symbols that are quite big, you know, in Western language, I think, you know, everyone's got a different story and different cultures have different stories. But that's something I want to say, actually. One thing I do, I use, I mean, the Western folklore and it's Western stories and especially kind of English, I'd say. I am... Um, my dad's English and I was like a bit of an Anglophile as a kid. I grew up, you know, really trying fantasizing about the Moors and about this sort of really, you know, the English landscape and English sort of Englishness, um, you know, Stonehenge and coming across um, Roman foundations and all this sort of, that sort of side, that romantic idea of, of British history. Um, which is why I studied what I did and why I sort of got my degree and was like, right, I'm going to go and see these things, you know. Um, 
we so I think now I be able to stay in Australia for longer because there's such beautiful romantic things in Australia too. Um, but this is very much the sort of thing I was fascinated by and still am. It's like that that trajectory of history that you can sort of see linearly kind of go off um, from you know from Celtic times to, to now and it's sort of like it's never sort of stopped. Um, so yeah this is another one that reflects that a bit. It's a Rome, it's a medieval village. Um, Partly, I think, inspired by like Gormenghast and this idea of sort of an endless, continuing, evolving sort of story that, you know, the foundations just keep building and building and building, which is like what I was fascinated by when I was living in London was like, you know, being in a street and there's, um, there's a Roman part of a Roman building and then there's, you know, a Victorian building. And then there's a, a skyscraper and they're all sort of next to each other and they all just coexist together. And that was like, found that really invigorating, just this idea that like you're constantly in touch with this different sort of time periods. It's like they're all happening at once, you know, so I think it's really fun, really fun to be there. Close up with that one. Um, filler math. So this is one about a girl who's reading. And the philomath is just someone who reads, someone who's interested in something. Um, um, I can't even remember what this one is called, actually. Uh, but it's based off of an orthological illustration of a bird in a trap, which I thought was really interesting. This, the, that sort of time when they had to, the Victorians had to kill everything to, to find out about it. You know, this idea of like taking everything apart. Um, you know, which isn't always how you have to do it. Uh, my first, my second time doing a reduction print. Um, I didn't really talk about that before. Reduction print is like um, sometimes called a suicide print because there's no going back. So you, you get one block um, and then you print each layer using the same block. So you carve away more and more and more each time until, you know, you've finished this layering up with this image. Um, and so that was my second time doing it. And it's really fun and I'm going to do more, but it's a way of thinking about it that you, your brain has to sort of, you know, really get into, really switch into gear and get into these different layers, which I always find really hard. Um, because I'm not really good at, I'm not hugely into draftsmanship, I'm not a fantastic drawer, you know, in that way of having depth and perception. And, you know, I didn't learn the fundamentals of drawing. So I sort of come at it in a much more graphic, simple way. So sort of picking something apart, in an image, in, in visually, I sometimes find it a bit hard. Um, but I'm really proud of that one. Um, this one, Somnambulist. Um, I just did this the other week, actually. Um, which is sort of, yeah, so she's fresh. Uh, Somnambulist means sleepwalker, and she's got the head of a poppy, so I think you can sort of put those things together, I guess. That's that one. Um, this is from the studies I did from the Moors, um, from Dartmoor, where I live. Um, and it's near Avon, near the River Avon. Um, and there's something really different for me, sort of doing these ones. And it was really fun. I think I'd like to do this again, for sure. Um, but there's a monoprint. So you just roll some ink out and you press the ink and press the paper onto that and then draw on the back. And then whatever you get is sort of, on the front is this image that can be like, not kind of how you expected, you know, sort of different textures and different things that have kind of come up in different ways. So that's really fun to do. Um, and this is part of a series I did about natural dyes. So there's a sort of coming on to the next thing that I do. Um, so Madder is one of the dyes and Indigo as well. And they're both sort of, you can, um, one is pink and one is blue, which is sort of what they are. Um, so yeah, so this is natural dyes. So the other part of what I do and what I studied as well um, is dye processes and textiles. So when I did textiles, you sort of do everything you do, fiber manufacturing, weaving and all those sort of things. Um, but what tied in really nicely with studying etching um, and copper plate etching and those sort of things was um, the dye processes. But I think, like I said before, there's all this great language around it. There's mordants and there's alum and there's all these sort of 
chemicals and potions and you're making them all together and you sort of, you know, and it's slow and it's sort of like experimental in the way that I felt was really scientific for me. Um, so yeah, this is a one I did last year. Um, so uh, when I did my t-shirts, so I don't like, um, this is a very, it's sort of very commercial outcome for something that's quite like process driven. Um, so it's quite fun. So I have this sort of, you know, I go out and I forage these things from the hedgerows and I sort of make these sort of dye bars and I experiment with how they sort of, the outcome of these fabrics. But you never really know what it's going to be like. And then I just, I do cotton t-shirts um, and I dye them in different ways in these different colours and I print on them and I sell them and it's, um, yeah, it's sort of like, so it's not a huge sort of big, I just like the fact that it's these two things that are quite different that kind of come together to make something that's quite simple. Um, so yeah, dandelion and alum. So alum is like a mordant, it's like a fixer and it also changes colour a little bit. So often you'll, you get your fabric and then you um, soak it in the alum and that sort of opens up the fibres to allow the natural dyes to come into it. So, so it changes the, the way the fibres work a little bit. So these are experiments I did. And that, this is black bean and white vinegar. And that was the pink, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, so you sort of, you can use anything. So I use kitchen scraps a lot. Um, avocado skins are really good, like husks, the dark avocados. Avocado skins and seeds make a beautiful pink. Um, black beans make a blue, um, except in this case, um, which is quite lovely and onion skins so it's things you have around and i sort of love that this is really easy um and you can just change something straight away but i also go and get things from um the hedgerows but not as much because there are laws as well about sort of picking certain things i don't just want to go and pick everything um but dandelions and grasses and lichen a little bit as long as lichen as long as I've sort of found it, I haven't like picked it off anything because it's, you know. So that's black bean. Um, and that's a black bean t-shirt that I dyed um, last year. So it's sort of a summer thing for me as well because I've got to do it outside. Um, so I'm sort of gonna start doing them again. So these are all sort of old things that I haven't got anymore. So t-shirt I did, and that's um is that that's turmeric turmeric and onion skin on that one so um i dye with it over dyed so we would have been taking three dye bars for that one so you dye it with the alum that would soak in the alum then dyed it with the turmeric and then i would have cleaned that and then i would have over dyed it with the onion skin um and that sort of the onion skin's got quite high tannin count in it and that looks really good for fixing colors so if i over dye with the onion it'll lock the turmeric in and so it gets that beautiful golden color. Um, this one is also onion skin and avocado. So you can see the avocado is a beautiful pink. Um, that's sort of bag I made. Uh, yeah, it's always coming to the end. So this is a little book that I did as well. Um, these are all based off of um, occult symbols for protection. So all these little symbols in here that I've drawn, that I've printed. And that's something that I do a lot as well as small books. Yeah, that's sort of it. I think I rushed that quite a lot, but um, do you have any questions? What happens now? Is that pretty quick? Sorry, Pete. I feel like that was- No, really that was brilliant. Um, it, 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 no, it just flowed really well. Um, I, 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 I don't think you rushed it at all. It was a really- um, it's all a blur. informative. I mean, if, if people have questions, please, you know, I mean, we, we could just open up the chat or uh, if you want to um, just put them in the chat or you can maybe just kind of uh, unmute or something and, and ask mm, questions. I mean, so. I've got loads of questions. Uh, I've, um, I've, got a, I've got a whole kind of, a whole load of notes that I made. Good, didn't you? That sounds great. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> This is, yeah, look, Jordana, um, Jordana from Grow, of course. Um, she said, I'm going to read the last bit first. She said, I love your work. 
Um, and I, I, I concur. And mm -hmm. um, can you elaborate on how archaeology has influenced your work? I think that's a really good question, actually. Yeah, um, thank you, because I was really nervous at the beginning and um, my brain went completely flat and I, um, I couldn't think about why I brought that up. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so um, it's, it's like, I, th I think I did say, yeah, I, I was obsessed with England and with sort of um, connecting back to history. And I think I studied archaeology and I really sort of wanted to, um, you know, everyone studies archaeology because I want to be like um, Indiana Jones or, or be like kind of the guy who discovers Tutankhamun, you know, they go to this, they go to this cave and they open the door and there's these incredible treasures inside. And you're like, oh my God. But I think really most people, I mean, there is that element to it. You'd love to do that. But I think also it's about understanding ourselves. Um, and understanding that our motivations as humans and sort of how we got to the place that we got to. And I think you, if you see sort of, the more you look back into time, the more you realise how short it's been that we've been here and how much we've done and how much we've discovered. And this part of that is this amazing visual language that we've always had. You know, you go back to like cave paintings, like, um, the French the Lascaux caves and sort of caves in Australia. And, and people have always been been artists, have always been visual, have always been making these things. And, and often, like, especially at the Lascaux Caves and that sort of cave systems, you've ever see, there's a great documentary that um, Werner Herzog did called Cave of Forgotten Dreams. And he just shows you all these cave paintings that was done, you know, 30,000 years ago. And they are, they're really simple, you know, I mean, obviously, but they're also amazing. But they're all, they're animals, they're, they're bison and they're deer and they're just sort of, putting these images on there that reflect their connection with nature and their connection with the environment around them. And I think that's something that I've really wanted to continue to do as well, to sort of take these animals and just sort of make them into symbols of you know, the environment around us and symbols of things that we sort of want to explore and continue to explore visually like that. And how we do use them in that kind of way, like that we do make them guides for um, understanding our connection with the world to a certain extent. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, I mean, you're, you know, you say you came, it's, it, it's odd because I, I did an interview with Edwin, the graffiti artist. And yeah. He, he was the same. He kind of came to England to kind of rediscover some sort of lost roots or something like that as well. And it was, it, it was quite, it, you know, I think maybe a common thing for people from, the other end of the world you know that kind of yeah but you 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 know you I, I think you know you lost you talk about the skull cave paintings and mm. the, the indigenous um original um australian population i mean they, they just keep discovering more and more stuff yeah there, which is older and older they sort of keep going back and back into time as well which is amazing yeah unbelievably sophisticated um mm. artworks you know mm. Their, their, their images of pipe fish or something they, they think they the, the sort of they think that it's a kind of ancestral memory from the end of the ice age when there were loads of pipe fish washed yeah. up on the beaches and things like that and yeah it's incredible that, isn't it yeah yeah uh, i yeah i mean um, more questions please more questions i mean i've got a few i mean i, I wrote down loads of stuff because i think it's fascinating um mm -hmm. i think Archaeology is like a dream job for a lot of people, isn't it? It's yeah. Just... I mean, I think, <coughs> excuse me, um, talking about, you know, Australian art, like that sort of, you know, Australian art, um, archaeology and that kind of idea as well. I think it's sort of, I mean, I don't think I gave Australia much of a chance when I was there, I think. But I think that's partly because it is wrought with so much other things going on. It's never felt like somewhere that I was supposed to be. That I belonged in you know it has this amazing rich history that it's is its own and it's there's culture that is supposed to be there that it's you know that, that connects to and I think that I was seeking that same sort of connection that the Aborigines have with the land but for myself but you know for a land that I felt like could be mine you know which is why you know coming from an English heritage you go okay well it's this because it can't be this one because it's not yeah, you know, that's not part of my bigger story. Doesn't yeah. it? it's, you know, it's not my ancestry. I mean, yeah, I, I had a friend who was an archaeologist and he said they dug in pouring rain and mud for like mm. 
months in Chelms Chelmsford, this Roman kind of, and he said a student turned up and the next day she found the, the most um, perfect and example of a Mithraean kind of gold bull. Amazing. In the dirt. And, and then she just left the next day and they were just like really angry because it wasn't That's glamorous. It. Yeah, so like, all, they, their feet, they all had trench foot and they were all kind yeah, of like... Yeah, spend your whole career so, just you know, sort of doing hot shards somewhere. And just what do. Do. <laughs> oh, what's this, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> more, more, more questions, more questions. A um, couple, a couple of really good ones, actually. Uh, Jordana says, thanks uh, for uh, elaborating on archaeology. Um, more of a practical question. Mm -hmm. What paper do you prefer to use? Oh yeah, that's such a printmaker question. It's really good. Um, really um, good. I it really depends on how I'm printing. So if I'm printing um, by hand, I have to use a thinner paper. So I'll use like a washi sort of a Japanese sort of or a Himalayan paper, and they're sort of got really low GSM. So they're about ninety and seventy GSM. So they're quite thin, um, and that sort of means I get a clearer print. But in a perfect world, I'd use a nice thick bamboo, <laughs> something that's really lovely and lush and has a great sort of feel to it and has a great texture to it. Um, but I have to sort of work with what I've got at the moment. So that's a fantastically nerdy paper question. You've got access to that stuff down in... Uh, you're in Totnes now, aren't you? We're in Totnes, yeah. So there's a fantastic print shop on the high street, um, Paperworks, and I usually get my paper from there. Um, but at the moment, I've been ordering it online through a company that's um, somewhere in the north, but hand printed, and they've got a fantastic selection that they send me. It's great. You can get anything online these days. I bet they're based in Hebden Bridge. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember, fortunately, but they're fantastic though. They've got really good selection stuff. Brilliant. We've got um, a, a question from um, Catherine Small. Beautiful Hi. works. And she says, you mentioned woodcuts and etching at the beginning. Yeah. Are you interested in exploring these? Or are you happy that that um, bolder liner cut handprint yeah. with a bolder liner cut handprint that you do now? Also, can you new, use natural dyes for printing? Mm. Um, yeah, I am. I did study etching at school, um, at uni. So um, that was my major. So I did copper plate etching. Um, so I loved doing that. Um, but then I actually bought some wood last week or a couple of weeks ago um, to have to play around with, just a small piece. And I love to try that. Um, always open to trying. I think it's actually kind of like time <laughs> to try something new. I feel like this, you know, I've been doing the same sort of thing for a while now and I think you need to keep exploring as an artist and keep refreshing. So I'm definitely exploring. I think it's harder. I think it's about learning that slightly different techniques again. I don't think it's going to be all the same. So that's exciting. And yes, also uh, you can use natural dye techniques. Um, it's something that I really only do a little bit of um, in really simple ways. I mean, there's some fantastic people that use natural pigments for everything. And, you know, and you can. Um, I've used turmeric before. Um, because it's just so accessible and it's so easy to get a great colour from. So just mix it with like a wheat paste um, and use that to print on. But they are fugitive is the word. So like they won't, the colour won't stay fixed. It'll fade quite quickly. And I think that's something I've had a hard time pinning down is how to print with it and have it be like archival, which is what you would use and as have as an ink. So something that's going to last for a long time and be part of someone's life for a long time. Yeah. Do, you, um, do you know oak, oak galls that hang? Yeah, from? I've so, got a friend who uses them. Which is, yeah, they're, they're really cool. You can you can make an ink from it, and mm. I think it's a, a, I, I assume it's a lasting ink because there's two things in 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 Britain that I know that uh, is it like Shakespeare wrote right? with but, them? Like that. Well, no, it's not actually. But that's what we would have written with. I think it, it yeah. probably was. Yeah, mm. and, it, and it's a weird smell. Um, it smells of it kind of smells really irony, like blood or something like that. Yeah, right. Um, I think you'd have to look online how to make it, but you you mm. you get the oak galls and you make this ink. And the two things they're allowed for, which suggests that they're long lasting, um, this this black ink is legal documents, certain legal documents. 
and uh, Jewish Torah scrolls. It oh, wow. Has, has to be written with oak galling. So if, if they're Jewish Torah, Torah scrolls or legal do documents, I imagine they're... Lasting. They're, yeah, yeah you, I think there's you, a, you don't want them to fade, do you? you know? The theory that I think Shakespeare would have been using them, that most people at the, his time, at that time, ink would have been made on those. So there's the, um, it's a wasp larvae sort of encasing, isn't it? So something really weird about that. And something I love the idea of, that's something I love as well, like these sort of things. It's like, how did you find this process out? You know, like these amazing sort of discoveries you have, like, you know, from printmaking processes to discovering that, the larvae shell of a chestnut is going to make a perfect dink to die, you know, to work with forever. It's sort of, it's crazy. Like, yeah, that discovery, those moments of discovery. I mean, um, please, more question in the chat, please. But um, okay. I'm going to, um, I'm going to try and segue in, you know, that's, that's a clever word, isn't it? Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, your early, you, the, the mushrooms, the, yeah. The, yeah. So I was trying to identify them. And, and in the, the the handprint, the one that the, yeah, yeah yeah, and and so I was getting like the Paracel mushroom, mm -hmm. maybe like the Penny Bun, the Bali, the Fly Agaric, the, the Liberty Cat, the Stalacybin one, the Field mushroom, and and then another one that I saw was like the Shaggy Ink Cat, which is the probably it's so far back. I would I would look back into it now, but um, go back right to the beginning. The Shaggy Ink Cap is is another is another one that you can make ink from, isn't it? Mm. Which isn't. And yeah. I, I really like, is it since you became, is it since you moved to Devon that you, because I know you were in Hackney Wick for like very, yeah. quite many years, you know, and is it since you moved to Devon that you've discovered the, the processes of, of, of hand dyeing and, and, you know, alternative kind of earth yeah. colours and things, or is it, is, is that part of the reason you moved or? I think it's part of the reason I moved. I think it's something I've always been interested in. Um, I think, you know, speaking, touching on Hackney Wick again as well, it's something I, you know, I lived there for a long time and I was sort of coming to a place where I could come into myself a bit more. So I think, you know, I kind of, I'd say I grew up in Hackney Wick and I sort of tested out these different ideas and they sort of, as they began to solidify themselves and, you know, that's when I sort of, knew what I wanted to do and moving to somewhere in the country was the inevitable conclusion of that in a way going to explore somewhere and I think I would have continued to do it no matter where I was I mean I've got friends who live in London who, who do natural diet processes but I'm just so lucky that I can do it here and that I can sort of go and find these things um, and explore it in a way that does feel very much more like it's a ritual and like it's a you know um, based on something more spiritual than I would feel if I was doing it in London, I imagine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so trying to segue again, like, um, I once did a, a kind of painting course with a, a Turkish um, master from Istanbul, yeah. uh, Hebrew painting. And it's the, the kind of stuff that you lay into water, different dyes, and then you dip the paper in and Oh, and, it, yeah. and and it's kind of based in Sufi tradition, which is they he was very keen of using all all earth colours. They're not they're all natural colours and yeah. um, you know the ochres and uh, you know the, the deep you know Indian reds and all that kind of stuff that come from rocks and minerals. And um, when I spoke to them, they they were very you know about it being a spiritual kind of thing, like, a, yeah. you know, it's a Sufi kind of tradition. So I, I guess, is that something you are trying to get involved with or? I think. Um, interested in. I'm interested in the, the sort of way that we've always, um, the way that we, like, we use nature, you know, we can guide ourselves by nature. You know, there's like, there's the seasons change and there's, you know, that means that things change and there's different things that come out of the ground at different times of the year and we can sort of use those things to explain our, pl our place and everything. Um, and, yeah, and I think I would... My dye process, I don't so much, but I think that's something that, like, with my printmaking that I am trying to sort of touch on a bit. And I think maybe bringing those two things together is something that I need to do more as well. Like we're talking about pigments and dyeing with pigments and things like that. I'm very much stuck in the traditional printmaking idea of like 
black archival inks and it's very bold colors and these sort of things. But I think maybe tying them together would create that sort of more of that spiritual idea, that idea of foraging these things and then representing in print what I've sort of been exploring and making, you know, that would be fantastic. The next stage, I think. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a, it's a very current thing anyway, isn't it? Just, uh... Well, yeah, I mean, natural dyes is, which is fantastic. But I think partly like, what I love about it is that it's sort of changing your idea of what colour should be a little bit because colours are, you know, synthetic colours are so bright. You know, like hot pinks is hot pink is amazing. It's one of my favourite colours, but it's so, you know, it's so fake, isn't it? And this idea that, like, yeah. this is the strongest colour you're going to get. You're going to get a peach color out of this. You're going to get a pale brown. You're going to get a light, you know, light green. And this is sort of the shades that you're going to be, the, the, that are real. These are sort of, you know, these earth shades. Absolutely. You know, the, 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 I think, you know, in terms of English art, the, the pre-Raphaelites were the first people to actually use, you know, like the monarch of the glen with the big purple sky behind yeah. it. Those colors didn't exist. They, they were no. part of the Industrial Revolution, you know, the cobalts the thalassine dyes and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. they, um, they, they, they're like chemical dyes. Yeah, I think I've got a book about mauve and how it was discovered by mistake. It was sort of like a byproduct of um, some sort of chemistry experiment and he came up with mauve. Yeah. It was sort of mind-blowing. People were like, my God, like, everything I, gets I, I, I came up with the theory of relativity and he came up with mauve, you know. Yeah, I know. I think it was a bit like that. There's a photograph of them all and one of the guys is the mauve guy. It's like, oh. <laughs> I've, got another <laughs> great, I've got another great question as well from Catherine, Catherine Small. Um, you mentioned you're interested in skulls and uh, memento mori imagery. Is yeah. there any other imagery you're wanting to explore? Um, I think I'd like to tell stories more, um, a bit more literally, maybe, and a bit more sort of figuratively. I think getting into figurative images, especially folk tales around um, women and women and transformation. Uh, I've read a few great books and a great, you know, there's a great collection of stories about sort of you know, Selkies or women from different sort of beliefs that sort of, you know, Melusine, who's like a, a serpent lady, you know, those sort of, I love to tell those sort of stories, tell these sort of stories about women who transform for whatever reason it is, whether it's from a curse or it's from, you know, um, uh, this desire to be closer to nature and those sorts of things and be a bit more narrative and a bit more, you know, illustrative in my images. I'd really love to do that and tell those sort of those women's stories a bit more. For sure, yeah. yeah. Um, the somnambulist, I'm going to try and say it. Somnambulist. Somnambulist, yeah. Mm. Um, you seen the cabinet of Dr. Caligari? Yeah. Which yeah, is yeah, yeah. based around this kind of character, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's so great because it's just about sleepwalking. I mean, it just means sleepwalking. It doesn't, there's no, nothing nefarious about it, but they managed to sort of, I think it's Victorian time that they had to be weird. You know, they had to make it into something else. It had to be this connection to the liminal or this idea of like, um, you know, um, being possessed or I think Freud got on, on board and he said it was about like um, desires and unspoken desires. You know, there's always these sort of vaguely mystical reasons for something like that happening, which I was really interested in, but yeah. That's, and also she's just got Poppy. So I think Poppy is really about, yeah, sometimes it's just drug related, maybe, you know, sometimes it's just that simple. I've got, I've got a question. I've got to say thank you um, to David, who's our um, invisible, our somnambulist somnambul um, sound man, who's, who's kind of overseeing this and making sure it actually works. So big thanks to David. He's done all these kind of talks every night and it's, it's brilliant at this and he's he's he's, he's sent a question and he's a kind of question statement and a reflection really which is um he's talking about natural dyes and t-shirts it came to mind that the important of vocational professions in community driven societies as opposed to the establishment where there's um mass production of goods took place um, you know, every uh, you know, perhaps every craft person or artist could dedicate their lives, and every customer 
would get exclusive pieces of art and that would make more of an impact on society mm. and we'd be more aware of the value of, of things. Yeah, I mean, I think we have lost that sense of, um, of the value of something like that. And I think that's something that someone who considers themselves a crafter, you really struggle with to sort of, you know, justify something yeah, the, uh, being made that way and how, you know, what it's supposed to be worth. And you're fighting against big companies and you sort of, you kind of you say, but buy my T-shirt. And I think that would be amazing if there was a world where we could really value. I think it's happened a bit with pottery, a bit with ceramics. So, you know, I think there's a market now for people buying a beautifully made mug for 35 pounds or whatever. And because they, they know the, the history of that and they know that what's gone into that. And I think that there's something still quite disposable about garments and about clothes but I think that's changing too I think you know that's starting to become part of it too is that people don't want to dispose of things that way they want to have fast fashion they want to sort of you know yeah yeah I mean it's a strange one isn't it you know you yeah but you, you, you the kind of thing where you'd have a pair of jeans and you'd never ever wash them and then when you did you know and, and then you wear them until the knees came out and then you yeah. patch on them and and they become a kind of a diary of, of all your exploits, you know, like a yeah. tattoo or something like that. And, yeah. and and then, you know, like maybe 10 years ago, suddenly jeans were like £2.50 in price. Yeah. You're just like, how are, the, how are you making this stuff for yeah. this kind of money? And it's just insane, isn't it? And you don't buy things to last. It's just quite natural to do that. The expectancy of something being quite short is, you know, quite, is fine. It's quite normal. It's a normal part of everything. Yeah, I think that's something I want to change as well because I do buy T-shirts in, a, you know, stock, like wholesale T-shirts. And I think if I wanted to really be sustainable about it and really sort of be, you know, bespoke, I would make my own or I would find find some way to sort of be a bit more sustainable in that way too, which is sort of, yeah, something I'm still looking into. There must be someone in Top Ness who's kind of weaving them. <laughs> oh, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. But that's the thing too, you can imagine that you go from a £20 garment to a, you know, this amazing precious artwork, which, you know, but that's fine too, yeah. I guess. It does cost a lot of money, doesn't it? Yeah. But to make things. Um, loads of questions. So, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to shut up and just read these questions. Um, and naturally segueing right now, um, about talking about value two people have said where can we buy your your um your works and that's that's jordana and Catherine. um where can you, got, come on plug yourself you know yay. <laughs> uh thanks guys <laughs> thanks you interest i've got um a shop uh a folksy which is like a british etsy um uh and i don't know what it's called folksy <laughs> dot com forward slash hannah smith hannah jane smith i think it is but yeah, i've also got a link on my instagram which is how people get most of my stuff if you go through my instagram which is she dissolves um at she dissolves at instagram dot com and i've got a link on my bio to all my stuff there which is the only way you can get things these days because i can't do markets anymore so you're not allowed to do those no, we will be able to One soon day. yeah uh, jordana says um and, and she's referencing our talk last night, which was really, really interesting as, as well. And um, she says also on the subject of, the subject of uh, colour has come up and uh, I wanted to highlight um, Sadie Murdoch's book choice um, from last night's book club, um, which, and, and it's really good and it could be useful. And it's called M Michael Taussig, that's T-A-U-S-S-I-G, -S Michael Taussig. Um, oh. What Colour is the Sacred? And it's uh, published by, in 2009 by the University of Chicago Press. Um, don't worry, we've got all this stuff in the chat and we yeah. saved and everything. It was a really interesting book. And, and, and when you were talking about colour and, and what colour is and yeah. where colour comes from, and it, 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 you know, it deals with kind of a lot of things and, and the colonialism of colour and all that. Yeah, kind of stuff. And, yeah. And, I mean, it didn't all come from the one spot, did it? Sort of, I mean, I think I've got this great book on natural dyes um, for, of, the UK, of the UK and a lot of colours were brown and it's very derivatives of brown. So people wouldn't have been wearing anything particularly amazing. Like you would go and you want to wear something special, you go and dye it with nettles. So you'd have a different shade of grey or green to your, your neighbour, 
you know, and it wasn't for a long time until cochineal was discovered. And that's, um, you know, that's, it's pink and red. Yeah. And, and madder is red as well. And they were, they were really hard to make and really hard to fix in, into fabric. So you'd be really wealthy to have to have that red, red and purple, like the royal colors for that reason. And yeah. And, I, and then when the, the market, when the world was opened up and you could travel and there was transportation with things like you go and get lapis lazuli from across the other side of the world to make blue, yeah. you know, and that's grinding up the stone and mixing it with things. And what a precious commodity it would have been to make something with that color, you know, that's like- It yeah. still is though, isn't yeah. it? I mean, yeah. People grind up Victorian bottles to get lapis lazuli. Like, yeah, you can do that in malachite. It's like, contained in them. You know, yeah, it's crazy that you know the value of these things and sort of like, and that makes it does make it holy, doesn't it? When you're doing something like that, when something's come from the other side of the world, and yeah. you know, yeah, nothing suddenly everyone happens. can be a bishop or a Caesar, you know, yeah, yeah, it's a technique, it's like technicolor, it's like going from black and white to technicolor to see that, you know, in the flesh. It's a strange parallel, isn't it? It's that kind of it, the thing that something like that represents to society, which yeah. is an, 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 an un, unimaginably expensive commodity that only the very powerful can afford. And then you free it up with the Industrial Revolution yeah. to everyone can afford it. So everyone's a bishop, everyone's a Caesar. Yeah, that's and then, it. Then, then like 100 years later, now it's, it's, it's the other way around. It's like... Mm. It, it, it's actually damaging the environment, you know. So people are going back to... Yeah. Earthy kind of colours or something. Well, the interesting thing as well is going back to these things and so going back to handmade stuff is actually something that's quite an elite thing to do now. You know, you can't you can't be the every person and well, have yeah. kind of like, you know, that William Morris idea of, of having everyone having their beautiful, beautiful and useful houses. You know, it's sort of like, yeah, that would be fantastic. But, you know, I can't do that with my £30 mug like, or my, you know, these sort of things. I love the idea of that being a thing and I think it, it's a great idea and a great ideal to with heart hold. And, but I think the more you do it, is the more it's going to happen. That's, you know what I mean? It can't happen in a, in a little glass prism. It has to be something that's like quite a normal thing to do. Yeah. yeah. Has to be normalized. Yeah. Yeah. Um, has anyone got any more questions for uh, Hannah? Um, this, it's been a really, really, really interesting talk. I, I, I loved, loved every minute of it. I made loads of notes and stuff. I, I wrote things that down yeah. like rural gothic. Yeah, I feel like I really talked really fast. So I'm, I'm glad you, I don't know if that was, you know, fed through everything quite quickly there. I tried, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been fantastic. Brilliant. It's really fun, yeah. Uh, Jordana says, no, but this has been brilliant. And, and I... I you know, I, I, I echo that and I'm sure everyone does. It's um, um, absolutely brilliant. Um, Catherine says, no more questions, but it's been very interesting. You've answered most of my questions just in your discussion. Well, thanks, Catherine. It's lovely chatting with you as well. Well, you know, thanks for doing it, Hannah. I mean, it's a really, really interesting body of work and see it grow from Hackney Wick and to well, right, what, yeah. where you are now and... Well, let's see. It's nice to be in touch with Grow again. It's nice to feel that little Grow family, sort of, you know, from all the way from over here. You, yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. When, when we start the jazz night again, I expect to see you at the bar. That's it. I'm going to be straight there. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, once again, thanks so much. Thanks to David for Thank um, looking after us, as always, you know, in the back room, doing whatever he does on his computer and tweaking the sound and the vision. Um, thanks for everyone for coming. And um, I'm Jane Smith. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you.